Last couple of weeks, we have covered topics in Acts chapter 6 and 7 and the circumstances that led to a shift of focus that we see from the apostles to a young man named Stephen, who is described by Luke as being one full of the faith and one full of the Holy Spirit, and also described as someone who is full of grace and power. Luke says that he was doing great wonders and signs among the people. And Luke says that the crowds could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen was speaking. When he was seized by the crowds and brought in front of the council, Luke says that all who gazed at him saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So before we go forward, we should understand one truth about human beings. We are mere vessels of clay. Whether it is Stephen or whether it is Saul who approved of his death and later transformed into the apostle Paul that we know and love. As Peter says in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So before we put Stephen on a pedestal and treat him with special honor, let's remember that when we read about the works of Stephen and the words of Stephen, we're actually witnessing the power of the Holy Spirit at work in a human being like you and me. And when a man or woman of God is full of the Holy Spirit, when he or she is full of grace, when he or she is full of faith, they can be used to be powerful witnesses to Jesus Christ in this world that desperately needs to hear the gospel. We see quite a bit of similarities between the last hours of Jesus and the last hours of Stephen. And it's no accident. Stephen being full of the Holy Spirit shows us how the Holy Spirit can help us emulate Christ through our actions and our words, even the last hours of our life. And this morning, I want to attempt to give a short survey of Stephen's sermon to the crowd as he addresses it. He addresses as his brothers and, and fathers. And all of us, most of us are familiar with his sermon, but this is mostly for our younger brothers and sisters to also learn. And Stephen's sermon is not a typical gospel message. We have covered Peter's sermons in, from previous chapters, and we have, you know, we have analyzed the gospel message in which he shared about the life, burial, death, of life, death, burial, re resurrection, ascension of Jesus. His sermon is not, not, does not follow that format. But Stephen's sermon actually follows the model of an Old Testament prophet who calls out God's people for their idolatry and their hard-heartedness. One thing we should understand from a big picture is that we're slowly seeing a shift happening in the early church. While many people are hearing the gospel and accepting Christ as their Lord and Savior, the message of the gospel is becoming more and more saturated in Jerusalem. Many hearers of Stephen Serban have already heard the gospel message a few times, and they want to end this new movement that is growing in power and number. This movement is a threat to their way of life. They see this new group as infiltrating their synagogues and is a threat to their religious practices. They believe that this group's claims about Jesus is an insult to their God and their fathers, beginning with Abraham. And when we look at Acts chapter 6 onwards, Stephen's death that resulted from his powerful sermon serves as a pivot point for the early church to expand the propagation of the gospel beyond Jerusalem and even beyond their own brothers Jewish brothers and sisters. So what is Stephen's sermon all about? Stephen takes us through a chronological journey, mainly through the three figures in the Old Testament, Abraham, Joseph, and Moses. And as I explain these things, have Acts chapter 7 open so that you can follow along with me. It is a fairly lengthy sermon, and, and you know, I, only by the Holy Spirit I can do even justice to what Stephen shares. As he talks through this chronological journey, he ends with the idolatry of God's people from the time of Moses until his era where the temple of Jerusalem is, is a backdrop. For today's meditation, I want to focus on three major, major themes of Stephen's sermon. First, Stephen's sermon is about God's servants who are part of God's plan of redemption but endured loss and rejection. Second, Stephen's sermon is an indictment against stubborn-hearted people. And in the ESV, the term is stiff 
stiff-necked. It's an indictment against stubborn-hearted or stiff-necked people who resist the Holy Spirit. And third and most importantly, Stephen's sermon showcases the God of glory who redeems his people. Because that's a lot, let me just repeat it again. First, his sermon is about God's servants who faced loss and rejection. Second, his sermon is about stubborn-hearted people who resist the Holy Spirit. And third, and mainly, it's about the God of glory who redeems his people. So now let's look at let's do the look to the sermon to find these find the themes that I just mentioned. So first theme of the loss and rejection about God's servants. Stephen begins with Abraham. And Pastor mentioned this on Thursday about, about the God of glory calling Abraham or coming to Abraham. Stephen begins with Abraham who left his father's house. Verse 4 says, God removed him from there. Stephen says in verse 5, yet Abraham did not get any inheritance in it. Not even a foot's length. But he was given a promise of an offspring. Countless like the stars in heaven. And even in that promise, there was an indication of a period of affliction of, uh, of his offspring for 400 years. But later they will be delivered into a land of their own possession. Then Stephen skips forward to Joseph starting verse 9. Joseph was sold into, uh, sold into Egypt and he goes through a period of affliction. But through circumstances he, he was made the ruler over Egypt. And by being in a position of power, Joseph summons his family members to find deliverance in Egypt during the famine. And over time, people of Israel grew in number, but a ruler came in Egypt who did not know Joseph and dealt harshly with his people. And then he leads us to Moses. Stephen recounts the rejection Moses felt from his time of birth, escaping the king's edict of being killed as an infant, and he, adopt, he was adopted by the Pharaoh's daughter. And although he received an elite education and he enjoyed the comforts and privileges of royalty, he never felt at home. His calling was different. His heart was with his kindred. Stephen talks about Moses at the age of 40 visiting his people and out of anger, he kills an Egyptian who was mistreating two Israelites. Moses assumed that his people would understand that their, that, that their deliverance will come through Moses given the position and power he had. But against Moses' own expectations, the Israelites rejected him. And Stephen says in verse 27 that they thrust him aside, saying, who made you a ruler and judge over us? And out of fear, Moses fled and becomes an exile. And as we know, 40 years later, God calls Moses and sends him back to Egypt to deliver his people. Stephen says in verse 36 that Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt, performing signs, wonders and signs. In verse 38, he says that Moses received living oracles, but the fathers thrust him aside, that term, once again and refused to obey him. So in, in Stephen's sermon, we're seeing Abraham, Joseph, Moses, three examples of those who were used by God in the redemption story woven from the beginning of time, but each of them faced loss and rejection in their own way. Second theme, Stephen's sermon highlights how stubborn-hearted people have always resisted the Holy Spirit by standing against God's means of deliverance. Stephen begins to pay with the patriarchs who are jealous of Joseph. Their jealousy led them to sell Joseph as a slave, Little did they know that Joseph will become their means of deliverance from the famine. Skipping forward to Moses, we see how, the, how Moses was rejected by his brothers. Stephen says in verse 27 and then verse 39 that they thrust him aside. They asked him, who made him a ruler and judge over them? They refused to obey him. Their stubborn hearts led them to make a golden calf. And Stephen says in verse 41 that they offered sacrifice to the idol and they were rejoicing in the work of their hands. Their stubborn hardness caused them to sin against God and they made an idol to replace the God of glory. They rejoiced in what they could do for their God. Lowercase g. They took pride in what they could do for their idol. This leads Stephen to talk about the tent of witness 
in the wilderness where God came to speak to Moses. And then he later says how Solomon through David eventually found favor in the sight of God to build a temple where God could dwell. So why did Stephen all of a sudden bring up the temple towards the end of his message after talking about Moses? And it was to make a point about their lack of understanding who God is. That leads me to the third theme. How does, God, how does Stephen destri- describe God in this sermon? We can see that in the first few words of his message. God is the God of glory. He's the sovereign one. He dwells in unapproachable light. As Paul says, no one has seen him, nor anyone can see him. How did God act in Abraham's life? He appeared to Abraham and told him to leave his father's house. As Stephen said, God removed him from Haran. God promised him an offspring. God promised Abraham that he will become the father of many nations. God became the father of Isaac, the son of promise. God gave Abraham and his descendants the covenant of circumcision as an act of consecration to him. How did God act in Joseph's life? Even though Joseph was sold by his brothers in Egypt, as Stephen says, God was with him. God rescued Joseph out of all of his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh. And through Joseph, his father Jacob and his brothers and the rest of his kindred were saved from the famine and God remained faithful to the promise of Abraham. Finally, how did God act in Moses' life? God protected Moses as an infant and allowed him to be raised by his own parents for the first few years and then later in Pharaoh's house. God called Moses in his time of exile at the age of 80 to deliver his people in Egypt so they can worship him. God saw the affliction and groaning of his people and he sent Moses to Pharaoh to let his people go. God delivers the people of Israel out of the hand of the Pharaoh and worked through Moses to split the Red Sea And perform many miracles before them. There was no doubt to those millions of people who was delivering them out of their troubles. But as we can see over and over again in scripture, the people grumbled. And they became impatient. As Stephen said, their hearts turned to Egypt. They formed idols that that they were accustomed to in their time of Egypt. And they gave the idol the glory for delivering them. Stephen says in verse 42, God turned them away and gave them over to the worship of the host of heaven. God turned them away. And this false worship, as we know chronologically, this leads to the eventual exile of the Jewish people into Babylon a few centuries later. Now let's fast forward to Stephen's time. The Jewish people took a lot of pride in the temple in Jerusalem. But as Stephen says towards the end, God does not dwell in a house made by human hands. Like the idols that their fathers once made. And, and, And Stephen quotes this, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord. God is God. God does not bend to the demands of man. God does show compassion to man, but he shows compassion to whom he shows compassion. We know that the entire Old Testament points to an ultimate deliverer. Joseph was used in a particular period of time. Moses was used in a particular period of time. But they were only a shadow of the one to come. And Stephen mentions the promise of the Messiah, quoting Moses in verse 37 of Acts chapter 7. God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. In the Gospel of John we read, uh, John 1, 17 and 18. For the law was given through Moses, and grace and truth came, from, came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. God the Father, the God of glory, has made known his Son to us. If Moses, wrote, Moses was able to receive the law written in stone, Jesus, who is, the, who is greater than Moses, has written the law in our hearts to the Spirit. And Stephen ends his sermon on a strong note. It almost seems jarring, you know. He's giving his chronological uh, narrative and then all of a sudden, um, him being full in the Spirit. 
he, he says from verse 51 to 53, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of your prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have all now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. We have to remember that Stephen is also speaking to experts in the law in the crowd. They knew the Torah inside and out. They had knowledge far above the PhDs of today. They became experts through a long lifeline, lifelong process of study. But they were uncircumcised in their heart and their ears. They could not grasp the simple truth that was clearly laid out before them all along. Not even that the Son of God was living amongst them in the flesh. But they crucified Him. Now before we think how heinous the Jewish high priests and leaders were, let's look at ourselves first. Stephen says in verse 53, You who have received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Well, we have, something, we have received something even greater. We have received the mystery of God hidden for generations, the gospel. And how much are we struggling to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel? How many times have we resisted or hindered the Holy Spirit by rejecting to walk like Jesus walked? How many times have we slandered our brothers and sisters by, who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus? Have we held back from forgiving others for their sin against us? Just look at Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, seeing the open heavens, seeing the glory of God, and seeing Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He falls to his knees and he cries out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Stephen honored his Lord to his last breath and he died. Hallelujah. Let's spend a moment of time looking to the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Let's look to ourselves in ourselves and, and ask ourselves, if there, are there areas of stubborn hardness where we are not allowing the Spirit of God to make us more like Jesus? Are there corners and rooms in your heart where you have not given it to the Lord? Where sin is creeping, where bitterness is creeping in, let us ask for the Holy Spirit to, to come in and, and make those areas of hard heartedness into heart of flesh. Do you struggle to understand the Word of God? Do you struggle to hear the Word of God? Let us ask for a circumcision of the heart to grasp the glory of Christ and the circumcision of the ears to hear. We have spent years of our life hearing the word of God, hearing sermons after sermons. Just in a fleshly way, we hear it and it goes throughout through the other year. But let us ask for ears, a true ear to hear and not just hear, but to do it. Hallelujah. We need, this, we need the power of the Spirit to do that. It is not a, a work of a willpower of man. It is the power of the Spirit that enables us to have circumcised heart and circumcised ears. And as the worship team comes up, let, do, you, do you want to walk as Stephen walked? Full of the Holy Spirit, full of grace, full of faith to serve Jesus and to speak for Jesus and to even see Jesus. Let us pray earnestly for that. One thing I know that is God looks at the person with a desperate heart. It's not, it does not really come down to our past or our, our, um, or our actions, so to speak. But it comes down to a simple, a simple desire of faith. To come desperate before him. To ask, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your grace. Fill me with the, all the faith. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace. We thank you, O oh God, for enabling us to hear from your word once again, Lord. 
We thank you that you created and you, re re you regenerated and you saved men like Stephen. Who, and you poured out your spirit upon him to, for us to see as, as an example of someone who, who can walk on this very earth. Lord, we pray that even to the last breath of our life, that we would showcase the characteristics of Christ. So much so that we, we, just, we just emulate him even in, in his, we just quote him. Help us to have the attitude of Christ towards those who give us pain. Help us to have a heart, a soft heartedness to hear the words that come from the men and women of God that you place before us. Take away every bit of cynicism and skepticism that rejects the word of God, that rejects the voice of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, oh God, that you would you will cultivate us in a faith so that we can walk in this earth and we can, Lord, preach the gospel with boldness. We submit us, ourselves completely before you, before you, God. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.